from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. This is the ninth year and the 220th episode of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. We sit down with Joe Bragg and discuss tight line Euro style nymphs. Joe has a better way of explaining this style of fly that I have heard on YouTube videos, read in articles, or heard on other podcasts. This episode is brought to you by FlyShack.com and their brand of saber hooks. You can purchase them online, $6.99 for $100. The upcoming Lancaster show, you can buy them in person, $7 per $100. They come in a variety of colors, styles, barbed and barbless, and I trust them. This is the hook I use the most in my fly time. So we're going to talk to Joe, and we're going to learn a whole new style of flies, and you can buy the hooks and material at flyshack.com. We have with us Joe Bragg. I met Joe literally a year ago tonight at the Somerset or Edison show. And one thing Joe's been able to do is explain to me the whole jig nymphing better than I've heard it on other podcasts. I've read about it. It's He seems to be the source. He explains it better than others. So that's why I've invited Joe on today. And Joe, for the listeners that don't know you, what's the celebrity you most resemble? Uh, uh, well, uh, it'd probably have to be someone who's not in a fly fishing world. Um, when I was in college, everyone called me Bertier uh, from Remember the Titans because they said that's who I look like. So, <laughs> and You're a big dude. How tall are you? 6'5". And when I met Joe, he pulls out this fly box. It's full of these flies the size of ice cream Sunday sprinkles and like a dude this big as time flies that small it was impressive well thanks yeah man all right so uh you're up in west virginia right now right the mountain about. state yeah pepperoni rolls right at the gas stations Absolutely. yeah yeah pepperoni rolls man it's something we got we have to have something that uh makes us uh stand out and it might as well be pepperoni rolls that uh, came from the coal miners so they could have something that didn't spoil in their lunch pails, man. Right on. All right. So, uh, when did, uh, when did fishing and, and outdoor life sort of come into your life? Uh, you know, when you, you're growing up in West Virginia, you, um, you know, we're always knocked for being a bunch of, bunch of hillbillies, but the things that what people don't understand is that we have a plethora of outdoor you know, woods and waters here and some of the best on the East coast. Um, and so growing up, I hunted and fished with my dad and my uncles and everybody and kind of, you know, that's what you, you look forward to, man. Hunting season was a, was a freaking holiday. You didn't go to, you know, you didn't go to class on Monday during hunting season and you waited for springtime to go trout fishing. Growing up into it, I, uh, farm ponds was where I kind of got my birth into fly fishing you know, you, my dad would tie on a, um, dry fly, catch a little bluegill and then it turned into bait fishing because the bluegill then got flung back out into the pond and you waited for a bass to come along. And, and I can remember that happening so many different times. So that was kind of the birth for me in the fly fishing. And then fly tying was in high school. I dated a girl whose dad had a bench and I spent more time with him than I did her and probably the reason why we didn't work out but that's funny <laughs> um that christmas i got a fly tying kit and started tying trying to tie fly i still have the some of the first ones that i tied and they just they, they look they look bad i mean you'd have to catch a, a blind fish with it but and i would tie i started tying spinner flies for my dad's uh spinning for trout and it just kind of continued on from there until where it is now and you're also a fireman. How did that play into your fishing time? <laughs> Same thing. Um, I uh, I grew up in the fire service. My dad, my dad, my uncle, an aunt, everybody was involved in the volunteer services. And for me, it was, you know, 
it's all I kind of ever wanted to do. Um, I was blessed to be able to go play football in college and get a get an education, but I knew that I wanted to uh, run into burning buildings and, and try to make a difference in a world that is changing so fast. And so um, a lot of times um, when we have downtime at work, um, you know, after dinner is our free time because during the day we're in class or we're studying or we're working on things. I go back into an office and try to drum up an imagination of a fly or a nymph or whatever I can. And the next time I go fishing, put it to the water and see if it works. What was it like the first time you had to run into a burning building that was not a training one? Like I've seen houses where they're abandoned mm. and they'll just burn it to the ground and, and use that. <laughs> it, it's 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 a very different experience. You're you're going into something that is completely out of control. You know, a lot of people don't understand that the fire does breathe. Um, you know, it's it's it it it's uses living. oxygen. It is, and it's a force that is much like a flood or anything. And when you go into something that is superheated, um, you know, and upwards of you know, 1100 degrees and much like a cop taking a, a weapon into a gunfight, you know, that is our weapon. We, 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 we bring the hoses in and, and try to stop it where it is. And our main purpose is to stay, save life and property. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate enough to have found my calling in this world between the fire department and fly fishing. And, um, you know, one complements the other. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into that. And that's kind of where fly fishing is for me. That's, that's my way of stepping away from the things that, that, you know, we can see on a daily basis and, and, and kind of letting it flow, you know, down the stream and letting it go. Um, but being inside of a burning building is it's hot. It's, you cannot see, and it is, uh, it's, it's something that a lot of people, um, it's hard to describe to them. It, it's like uh, getting put on a roller coaster and turning the lights off and then putting 800 degrees on top of that. Um, but it is one of the most thrilling but most serious things I think I've ever uh, experienced. Are there things that you've learned that people should avoid to prevent <laughs> fires? Uh, just be mindful, you know, be mindful of what you have around your house. Um, you know, uh, we can't, uh, we cannot, um, you know, we cannot stop a, a microwave from malfunctioning or a dryer, but if we can, you know, especially in the cold, you know, keep your, keep your, uh, heaters, um, uh, away from things that may, may ignite, um, matches and, and things and that sorts, if you have children, um, just try to be mindful, you know, uh, of your house or, you know, there's nothing like losing everything. And unfortunately with my line of work, you see people lose everything from pictures. And some of the best moments I've had is, you know, just crawling through soot, uh, of a burned out house, just trying to find a wedding ring and able to find it and, and give somebody something back that they think they've lost everything. That's, that's one of those jobs you, you're, cut out for it or you're not it's a rare type of human <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. well let's go talk about fishing now all right we can do that where should we start where do you want to start with the fly time the <laughs> material <laughs> the techniques you 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 pick it all right you, so you pick it when did you get into the jig fly tying and fishing is that how would you want uh, me to call it like a european <laughs> nymphine well, High that stick. is where that is where a lot of this has come from. Is the European style nymphing? You have the likes of George Daniels and Lance Egan and Devin Olson and these guys who have been able to travel the world and and compete for the USA fly fishing team. And th and that's one thing I've learned that a lot of people don't realize is that there is an Olympic for fly fishing. You know, they 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 travel to you know different areas they you know to to fly fish these these rivers and streams and they compete representing the united states they they you know there's a spanish team there's a czech team there's a you know there's there's an australian team and they're these people are going and they're watching these different tactics and um in fly fishing and they in the 80s they were really seeing how the, you know the the Czech team and the the French team and they were losing by big numbers 
And the reason why was because they started looking into the flies. They started looking to leader setups. And what we what we see now in this is that, um, you know, most when you're nymphing, what we what we see is depth. We need to get down to the bottom one third of the water column because that's the feeding area of these fish. They 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 hold on the bottom because not only is that, but it's where the nymphs are when, you know, when a nymph gets dislodged from it's 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 safety it's 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 home it trumbles along in that bottom one third of the water column and so it's trying to reattach itself to its safe haven to its its place of safety in the rocks and crevices of of the of the stream bed the only time that that differs is when there's an emerging uh bug when you know they're they're coming up through the water column to emerge uh to an adult fly to mate and continue the species per se and so in, in when they were looking at this, they started looking at, okay, well, how can we effectively get our nymphs to the bottom in a very quick manner and be able to get our drift in an, in an effective line and pick up fish that are in that one-third area? And so when you start looking at the jig hook, you start looking at the use of tungsten compared to lead and copper beads. You're, you're, you were finding out that these are more effective than, than say, suspension nymphing or with a strike indicator and stuff like that. And when was your introduction into that style of fishing? Um, blind and bumping my head along the way. Um, I, uh, I started into fly fishing and, and the nymphing, and I always heard, you know, that it, when we look at a fish's diet, it's, it's 90% subsurface. So we're looking at them feeding on nymphs all year long, 90 percent of the time everyone you know that the traditional style is dry fly fishing well when when we talk about being a successful fly fisherman you know we all want to say yes we, if we catch one fish that day then then we're successful and happy and that's the way it absolutely should be even if we don't get, get to catch a fish we're on the water we're out in nature we should enjoy it when you start looking at over a year's time, a fish is 90% feeding on uh, nymphs 100%, 365 days a year. And then when we look at the dry fly, when we look at, it, say, a sulfur hatch, it's 10% of a fish's diet, only 10% of the year, if you can kind of understand what I'm saying, because that fish is only feeding on that adult fly 10% of the time, maybe three weeks out of the year for that specific hatch. But if we go to the, to say, we say we take the same nymph and we or same fly and we put it as a nymph, we drop it down into the water column. We put it close to the bottom of the, of the substrate, of the stream. Then we're fishing a better chance all year long. I don't have to wait for that three week period or for that, you know, green Drake to finally become an adult. I can fish that nymph subsurface in November, in, you know, July, and be able to still catch the fish and be successful. Was there a learning curve? Absolutely. The learning curve is getting depth and being able to obviously look at uh, a, a pickup or a strike. Um, we, we, hear, we hear a lot of talk nowadays on french style leaders we we see you know this this movement from suspension or strike indicator fishing to a euro style nymph setup with a cider which is just a high visibility section of monofilament that's tied into your leader and you're basically waiting or watching for any angle change for any unnatural movement instead of just the natural flow of the stream and the learning curve is as a how to get depth uh, and B, when do I register that strike? A lot of people that I see when I'm guiding, you know, we use strike indicators when, we're, when I'm guiding because a lot of the people I am taking out on the stream have never touched a fly or rod or are very inexperienced with that. And obviously having that big strike indicator and seeing it, it stop or twitch or, or, or become subsurface, um, that's registered as a strike. Uh, the problem with that is is that if you, if you take and you suspend your nymphs with a strike indicator, uh, your nymphs now are basically swinging on a pendulum. And so for that fish to take that nymph and swim in either direction, it has to swim away to finally pull 
the strike indicator down. So if, if you've ever watched a trout, uh, when it, you know, if it, it it's, it's facing upstream and it takes a, whatever it, it is, a piece of, of, of silt or moss or whatever in its mouth, and it realizes it's not food, it immediately spits it back out. When we're suspending our nymphs with that strike indicator, we're tethering ourselves to the top of the water. And, and much like if you look at kids swinging on a swing, they have all that movement, but the bar at the top of the swing can stay right where it is. And if, if you, if you, it's hard to explain the analogy, but for that strike indicator to register, that fish has to swim two feet to one side or the other to effectively make the strike indicator register the strike. With, with European or tight line nymphing, high sticking with a cider, we're tethered directly to our nymphs. So we're watching, we can, we can either watch the cider for an angle change because we're actually following the cider down through the stream, or we're actually going to feel the direct pull or tug on the rod itself with a very sensitive rod. Um, there's multiple companies out now bringing out you know, nymphing rods specific for this type of fishing. Are there different types of water that are better suited for this type of nymphing? Like different types of, say, uh, limestone stream versus something with a high gradient? Well, I think what we need to look at, it, but we need to look at the fish instead of the water. Um, most trout will always face upstream. And what I mean by most trout is if you have, say, an eddy, that maybe the stream is flowing left to right, but because of that little eddy or that little pool, the water now is flowing right to left, and the fish will always face the way that the food's coming to them. Uh, what most people don't realize about trout is that trout are lazy fish. They, they don't want to waste a lot of energy for a meal that has less calories. So let's look at, say, a cicada when we have a cicada hatch compared to a small, you know, betas nymph okay um, they will waste a lot of energy for that cicada they'll come up and actually aggressively strike these 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 bugs because it's a large meal they can burn some calories to try to get up to uh, that meal when it's a nymph because of the flow uh, of the of the water it's constantly bringing food to them so all they have to do is they find um, a, a soft area uh, behind a rock or even in front of a rock where there's a nice little cushion. Um, transitional lines between flow that is what we call soft water, water that you see fast and, that's, and then slows toward a bank or, or somewhere where there's some structure that slows that water down because it's not beating their, their beating on their bodies a lot. It, it's, they basically can, can try tread water and watch that food come to them. And then the only thing they have to do is decide, do I eat this or do I not eat this? It, it's more about the presentation than it is really ab about the water. It's about presentation and understanding. If you have a high altitude, uh, much like out west, you have a, a plethora of stone flies because it's, it's highly oxygenated. It doesn't, out west, there's not a lot of pollution that can be in that water because it's all coming down off the Rockies. Um, out here on the East Coast, we sort of have the same thing, but we do not have the, the, the oxygenation levels that they do out West. Cooler water is another thing they have out West that we may not have. You know, here on the, uh, on the East Coast, we have little black sallies and little black stoneflies. But uh, out West, they have, you know, the salmon stonefly and stuff like that. So it, when you start looking at like, okay, well, this is a stream here, this is a stream here, this is a tailwater, this is a, a freestone, we need to look at the fish more so than we and the structure of the stream and how the water's flowing compared to just looking at it as a whole. My analogy is in, in this whole thing is when people ask me, uh, well, I'm fishing this stretch of river, I say, look at it like a puzzle instead of a, a, a picture. Take each piece out of the puzzle and look at it fish it, fish it correctly, and be able to get an effective drift, and you're going to pick up more fish than if you look at a whole stream and say, okay, this is a big pool, I want to fish this. Because then you're going to pick up fish that are in pocket water and in little runs, then going to a bigger pool where if it's a highly pressured stream, you're now looking, you're now trying to fish for fish that have, you know, in that week's time maybe had, I don't know, 
a dozen different tie- nymphs that are tied from fishermen. But if you start looking at it like small little pieces of, of a puzzle and say, okay, well, I can see a small piece of pocket water behind that rock, you're going to start picking fish up that most people are not going to fish for because they're going to walk right past that. And I was guilty of that in the beginning. You know, I wanted to fish the easy water, but now, especially on the Savage River in Maryland, now I would much rather fish little pocket water, hard to get to places because I realized that's where you're going to pick up fish a lot quicker than fishing the big pool that everybody likes to go to. How far are the casts you're making and the drift? Is I imagine mm-hmm. it's more close in because the tight line, you want well, the line well, under the rod tip. When you so with with tight lining, um, what we're trying to limit the effect of is gravity. Anything that creates sag or anything in our in our line is going to effectively make us miss strikes because it's not keeping it tight. It's not keeping a direct line to the nymphs, and so when we start looking at how this the euro setup is you know you have short line nymphing you have long line nymphing when you start looking at you know i hear people use you know regular fly line and 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 there's some very good fishermen out there that are using strike indicators um you know i have a friend that i fish with on a regular basis he's a very good fisherman he sticks to the strike indicators until we start talking about euro nymphing and the, the the breakdown of it the thing what we need to realize is that, okay, if we start looking at the diameter of our fly line, you look at a weight forward line, that weight is out forward on the line. When you start looking at, you know, how the nymph lines that are coming out that are diametered at 0. 0.022, we're effectively eliminating the no, Say that on one more time. The fly. You're eliminating. Um, so if we, if we, uh, if we use things like the competition nymph line where it's 0.022 in diameter and then neck it down to a cider that is 3x and then put 5, 4x to 6x, tip it on the end that goes directly to our flies, you can effectively make a longer cast out into a run or anything like that. Uh, when it comes to being short, if you can effectively fish a confident lie, where basically that means the fish feel very confident, they're safe, and it's short. Then you can shorten that line up and go to more of a tight line, high sticking version of that. Um, But if you're needing to cast at distance, then basically what you can do is you can grease it with some type of floating your cider and then cast it out a little farther. And basically what will happen is your cider will ride high on the water and you will watch it for any type type of twitch or directional change that is unnatural to the flow of the water. All right. What about when you hook the fish? What's your process? Are these rods more delicate? Are they harder to fight fish? Can no. You reel um, them in. You the, strip them in. So, so with, with when you when you are and I tight line them for not only small mountain stream trout but also steelhead. The tackle is a little different, obviously, for steelhead. Um, I'm going to go up in. Uh, I'm going to go up and tip it to more of a 3x or 4x or to possibly even 5x. It, it, it all. It all. These rods are meant to be very sensitive, so they're going to be light, and they're going to. The reason why they're light is because you're holding that rod out. Um, you're holding it up off the water, and they're ne- they need to be very balanced. Uh, in my, I, I previously did work with Temple Fork Outfitters, and their drift rod. Uh, matched with a the correct the correct reel balances in the cork. All of these rods, that is one of the biggest components, is, is, is because it needs to be balanced. It the weight can't be too far out, it can't be too far back because you will begin to feel it in your shoulder and in your muscle in your back muscles, and it will you know effectively in the rest of the day you're going to feel it. You're going to be sore, and it will be mean less time on the water. When you're fighting a fish, it, it's uh, especially trout because that's what um, what we're talking about here. You're you're basically going to try to do the same thing. You're going to keep a full C-shaped bend in the rod. You're not going to set it straight up because you're going to see a lot of rods break that way. You're going to be to the side. You want to try to keep that fish off balance. 
if you if you keep a fish and it's in it where it's facing upstream or downstream it's going to have its strength but if you can keep it off balance you can either a use the current to be able to pull it to the bank and get it to the net or get it to uh, where it's tired because we want to tire the fish out and then bring it to net effectively so fight it to the side so this I'm requires a great deal of paying attention to that line there's no daydreaming mm -hmm. when you're doing this no well it there's no daydreaming but when when you're on the water a lot of, what i think a lot of people forget is we fish for comfort i would much rather um and peace while i'm fishing it's a constant chess game it's what is in the water how am i going to fish it and what angle am i going to fish it you know do i want to just jump down in the water and walk around it's it's a chess game but for me I honestly feel some of the things that I deal with daily release and just flow down the water much like you would if you dropped, uh, you know, I don't know, your fly box. It would go flow until it either found a, a rock to stop on. But when you're looking at the line, you're looking at that sight or you're looking at that strike indicator. And I think the one, the hardest thing for people to get over is to, to, to register a strike, to see that change in angle. Um, or if a fish get, if a fish takes it and starts to swim upstream, that angle change going upstream. With this, with with the European nymphing, when you get the the flies out, you want to stop the rod high and you want to turn those flies over. You want them to enter the water first because that that effectively puts them to depth and puts them through the water column before the actual streams um, the actual streams current starts to unnaturally pull them remember these fish are seeing nymphs fly past them daily and our nymphs have to resemble the same speed and depth and look as the rest of them the fish are smart they're lazy but they're extremely smart if something looks unnatural to them they aren't going to eat it because again they've got an, all kind of bugs coming past them so how do we do that we get the line or the nymphs to actually f roll over the line, enter the water first, then your tippet and cider is gonna touch the water. You're gonna lift the rod up and you're gonna even strip a little bit line in because what you're wanting to do is you're gonna act, you, you're wanting to pull that tight line direct contact to your nymph. Then what, as the flow starts to um, affect the nymphs in the most natural possible way, you're going to slightly not you're not going to pull your nymphs but you're going to lead them just slightly keeping that direct contact to the nymphs any angle change is an immediate set if you don't have a fish if say you've touched bottom you're going to immediately go into an oval cast or a tuck cast which means effectively keeping your nymphs in the water longer and if it is a fish then it's a then it's a hookup if it isn't a fish we're just back up into the run, and we're starting our drift again. I think I'm ready to start picking apart the actual flies themselves now. All right. So why a jig-shaped hook? Is that specifically to get the bead on there? So with the jigs, first let's look at the beads that we're, we're, we're talking about. We're talking about using tungsten beads. Um, you know, you can go out and you can buy nickel beads, you can buy lead beads, you can look at copper beads, but let's kind of break this down. When you're looking at density, water is one. We know that if it's less than one, then it floats. If it's more than one, then it sinks, correct? We learned that in school. When we look at numbers, we look at nickel is 8.8. .8. So it sinks, lead is 11.34, copper is 8.9. Tungsten is 19.6 times greater than water. So why do we use tungsten? Well, the only other metals that we can go to is uranium, plutonium, and platinum, which is at 8.18.9, 19.8, and 21.4. I don't know about you, but I don't want to use any of that stuff for yeah. my beans. You got to steal so that's that from why, the Libyans. Yeah, yeah. So that's why we use tungsten. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the best metal that we can use for our beads to effectively get depth and then set up the drift or the, in the feeding lie that we want. So when we look at the jig hook, um, the jig hook allows the weight to be displaced to the top. When you take a slotted tungsten bead, you slide it onto a jig hook, 
and you push it forward, you're going to see that the bead actually sets and rides high on the, the hook itself. The reason why is because when it gets into the water, excuse me, when it gets into the water, it's actually going to uh, ride hook up. If you start to look at how nymphs are in the water, unless it's an emergence, unless they're emerging, when they get knocked loose from their crevice or anything, they're going to actually try to reattach themselves to the rocks. So they're going to be head down. Putting the jig hook or the, the tongue, slotted tungsten bead on the jig hook, it is, it is going to let the nymph ride hook down or hook up, meaning that it's going to be head down. The other reason why we use the jig hook is because that hook being up, it's going to allow less false hooks on rocks or, you know, crevices or anything that's on the bottom. It's going to keep your, your hook up and it's going to mean that you're not going to lose any flies. And if you do, it's going to be less than what you're normally using. The other reason why we want to use jig hooks and, and especially with uranymphing is it means that when a fish does take the hook, it's going to be a more effective hookup, meaning that it's going to hook into the top of the jaw or it's going to hook into the cre cre of, excuse me, in the side of the mouth of the fish. You're going to see a lot of these if you watch, you know, like I said earlier, Devin Olson, Lance Egan, uh, Jason Randall, any of these people that are that are doing this, you're going to see if they hold a fish up where that hook is going to be set. And, and if you know much about fish anatomy, you know, if we can get it in the top of the mouth or in the end of the crook of the mouth, then it's, it's going to be a, a more set anchor to be able to fight the fish and be able to bring them to net. And I had never seen anybody fish this method before until the Healing Waters tournament and you're with Braden. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe how far that fly bounced along the bottom and never fouled in that right. rocky water and i was just sitting right. there. that's when i was like i need to get you on i've never <laughs> seen anything like it i'm very naive right. to this style of fishing right and, and if you start to look at it and you start to break down the whys where's and how's of you know european style nymphing or just simply fishing with these types of hooks and and these types of beads then you're gonna see more hookups you know there's there's a plenty of information out there george daniels writes uh, I had just wrote an amazing book. Um, it's uh, Devin Olson just come out with a book. Um, Jason Randall, who who I've been very fortunate enough to become very good friends with, he has Nymph Masters out. You know, J uh, Devin Olson and, and Lance Egan came out with two DVDs. One is called uh, Modern Nymphing, and then the other one is called Modern Nymphing Elevated. And it's probably, if you're a visual learner, it's probably some of the best information that you can actually go out here, sit down with some popcorn and a notepad and actually pick up. They cover confidence flies. They cover the leader setup. They cover how to fish the different areas. And then they cover kind of how they brought it along to what's being, uh, it's what's effective for them. And, you know, they're, they're out in Utah. They're fishing high gradient streams. You know, there's a, a lot of information out here for this. Um, and it's picking up speed more and more each week. I mean, and I say week because I see more and more people picking this up and effectively fishing streams all over the United States and finding that it's an effective way to pick fish up year round. Um, you know, there, dry flies, dry droppers, streamers, it absolutely has its place. Um, but if you want to become a better fisherman, you want to have better fish numbers, then absolutely break into the the, the tight line Euro style nymphing game. Uh, you'll you'll definitely find that you'll you'll pick up fish more in hard places like pocket water than uh, and how to fish them because you so I've I fish double rigs unless I'm fishing a really tight piece of pocket water where there's flow coming around a rock. And I can put one fly into that pocket water and let it set up. Joe Humphreys is, is one of the masters at doing this. You know, he has a rule that he puts a fly into a piece of pocket water, counts to three and pulls it back out. It's blind striking is basically what it is. So, All right. so there's, uh, there's two types, I would say, of these nymphs that I've noticed in catalogs and social media. Mm -hmm. You got one that's sort of like the fuzzy, like a waltz worm that's textured. Right. 
And then there's an mm-hmm. other kind that's coated with solar res or they're right. very slick and mm-hmm. streamlined, but they don't look like anything in the water. Right. So uh, those are actually what would what I would return to as being French nymphs. Um, if you look at uh, if you look at these nymphs, so Czech style nymphs um, or Polish style nymphs, you're, what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, much like a grub or a scud or a or something in that. French style nymphs are very sleek. They're UV resin for and they're. I use Loon. I mean, I have Solar I, I use, but they're sleek because again when we look at the characteristics of how we're fishing this, we want to try to get it to the bottom as fast as we can. So we use the tungsten, we use a few wraps of lead wire, then we clear coat the whole body. And I use, I use Vivas thread. I'll take tinsel. Uh, what you see these actually, you'll see these called be called paradigons. These are very sleek. They're very, um, they create no friction as they sink through the bo- through the water column. The other ones that you see, they're they're you know you have your basic pheasant tail, you have an iron lotus, you have a tungsten surveyor, a Frenchie. Um, you're seeing these used with very they're they're they have some um, bugginess is what we call it, but there's not a lot. You know there's there's a thorax and maybe um, some type of wing case, but it's. They're try- what we're trying to do is we're trying to get these flies to depth quicker using weight, but also using the, 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 the shape of the fly itself. Right. So when you're tying, what are some of the materials you're going to put into these? And what are you trying to mimic specifically? Is it a, you trying to match a hatch, making it a tractor? Well, when, when you when you really start looking into this, the one thing that I love the most about tying is the imagination of it. Um, as, as long as you have an idea of what a bug looks like, you can sit here and, you know, it's, it's, it's like a cartoonist drawing a cartoon. You know, I can sit here and look at all my tying material and say, well, I want to take this and I want to put it into this fly. I want to take this and put it into this fly. Um, when you talk about French style nymphs, uh, the sleek, the, the sleek look, a lot of times it's just a color of thread. Um, we do use Coq de Leon uh, fibers, um, f- uh, medium or dark pardo for uh, the tail fibers because it resembles that uh, that barred look of a of a mayfly nymph. Um, I may use, say, if I'm tying a stonefly, I'll use some type of uh, a goose by it. Because um, when you look at a stonefly, stoneflies generally have two two tails, and I'll use that. But a lot of times, it's very, very sparse materials. You're using Coq de Leon, you're using thread, you may use a, a peacock curl for a thorax. A lot of the flies that you do see have some type of collar, and it may be a, a CDC collar. But then there's always a little hot spot in it, and you can use. I use a lot of Senyo's dubbing because it, it, I like the hot pink collar. Uh, a lot of times, it, that's that's just a that's a hot. They see it coming through the through the water column. A lot of people, what we forget is that if we fish the wrong flies correctly, then we can pick up fish. But if we fish the right flies correctly, then we pick up a lot of fish. And so, um, you know, there's a number of things out here that you can use to tie these flies with. Um, remember the tungsten bead, though, and, and you can use different colors of, of these beads. I mean, there's, there's hot orange, there's hot pink, copper, um, nickel, silver. But uh, I just tied some tinsel uh, paradigon nymphs, and it's just, you know, I use, these were called butanos, and what I used to tie these is, they're from Hairline Dubbin. It's crystal flash fluorescent fire orange. And it's two uh, to four fibers of Coq de Leon. You clear or you bring, uh, you tie in the crystal flash, wrap it up, make sure it does have a little bit of a, uh, little bit of a, um, trying to use the word, I completely forgot. Make sure it has a little bit of, of a, of a, a build, uh, a build to it. So it builds up to the, the bead. And then I use hot pink thread to build a hot collar on it. And then I, I, I whip finish and then I clear good um, uh, and then zap it with the light. And it's just a sleek fly that resembles a betas. 
So one thing I've noticed with a lot of these flies is there's a huge portion of the hook that's bare. Do the right. fish just not seem to notice this just curved? Actually, and I'm glad you asked over that the back? because you 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 asked earlier. You know what was one of the your biggest? Uh, you know what was a hang up for you? What was something? I always wanted to pile on all this stuff on a fly. And, you know, if I thought, okay, I'm tying a size 14 uh, on a size 14 hook, I have to pile everything down. What you can do is you can actually take and say, you know, say you're, you're a fly tire that, you know, you, you look at someone who tied a size 24 or a 22 or a 20 and you say, well, I, I, I can't do that. Okay, well, can you tie on that size 18? um a hook can you take and say even at an 18 you know i, I see a lot of uh, I, I i i do some work with um project healing waters and a lot of these gentlemen they're 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 vietnam vets they're 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 older they, you know their their eyes have you know they've taken abuse over the, the years of working or whatever welders is a big one um they say why well, I, I can't see you can actually tie a smaller fly using a size hook that is larger and all it is is just using less of the hook shank, um, you know, use half of it. And that's where and, – and, and the fish aren't going to – they're not going to see the hook. They see that fly. They see that hot spot, the tail. And, again, we, we go back to the verbiage of we can fish the wrong flies correctly and pick fish up. But we can fish the right flies correctly and pick a lot of fish up. And that's where a lot of people don't realize we, you know, we think, well, okay, well, we got to use the whole entire hook shank when we really don't. We can use half the hook shank on a size 18 or 20 hook, and it looks like a 22 or size 24 bug. Interesting. That's why I have you on here to answer these questions. <laughs> when you are tying them, is there – are you using any – you mentioned like to reduce drag. So you're not putting rubber legs mm -hmm. and, and other things that are going to stick out and cause them to slow down. I will tie depending on the bug. I'm a stonefly geek. I don't know why. I just like stoneflies. Um, you know, I, I, I envy the people that are out west. They get to, you know, fish the big salmon fly hatch that are stoneflies as, as big as your thumb. I, I will tie rubber legs. And I will also, tie. We got a, Joe's got big hands, too, so <laughs> it's disproportional when he's eating. You know. <laughs> well, I need to show you the size 30 dry flies I have then. Oh, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> careful and a lot of patience when, it, when i'm tying these uh you know you see the big push of the the, the squirmy wormy which is an absolute effective fly i know it's not traditional but is the, it is effective it gets to depth um when i'm tying stone flies like i said i'm a stone fly geek um i will use rubber legs i will use but where where i'm Again, when we tie these things, we use one of two ways. We either have the tungsten bead with lead wire, or we tie something very sleek with a tungsten bead. So we, we either use gravity for us, or we use we try to eliminate friction through the water column. So my stone flies, I absolutely will use some type of rubber leg material. I'll use uh, I'll find my font. If I can find my bag, I'll tell you what it is. But I'll use some type of legging material uh, to build on my stone flies because I like that leg movement on stone flies. Uh, when it comes to my my like like I said, the French nymphs or the the uh, the Czech style nymphs, I don't want a bunch because I want it to try to get to depth very very quickly. I will tie stone flies that are extremely weighted uh, for high muddy water. I want it. To, I want to try to get them down. You know, uh, when when water is up high, fish tend to push to the sides of the stream because, again, when we look at the the characteristics of water, water slows close to the bottom of the stream and close to the rocks because of the friction or that hydraulic friction that you'll see. Fish want to try to get into that when it's high water. You know, you, if you see someone um, fishing a uh, a high muddy stream and they're out in the in they're out in the um, the actual uh, main channel of the stream. They've passed a good number of fish up because fish will push to the sides of the stream because that's where the water slows. They they want to get into places where they don't have to burn calories to try to just 
maintain their position in the stream. So, yeah, I'll tie the, the bigger, the bigger stone flies that I tie for this, like the Pat's rubber leg or the buy it back stone fly. I'll tie a little bit bigger. I'll, I'll tie them down to size, uh, 14s and 16s. Um, because we have here, we have the little black stone fly hatch, which should be happening around this time. I'll tie the buy it back stone fly in a black, uh, full black body with rubber, small little rubber legs because it resembles that. Are there materials that just don't really work well? <laughs> some dubbings are, when you want to try to just put a little collar on it, some dubbings are just not meant for that. I, I don't know. I, I personally feel that it's all in the imagination. And um, I see a lot of people when they're tying, they they, they just, I mean, I, again, I was guilty of it. They pile so much stuff on a fly. And, and, and in every, if that fly works on your water, then absolutely. Because I know that there's streams that are in the United States and beyond that, you know, maybe just a little bit different color. Uh, it works on that stream. I know in central Pennsylvania, a couple of years ago, I had a friend who went up and it was, a, they went up for the sulfur hatch, was completely excited and they were fishing and, and saw some guys downstream, you know, throwing dry flies and, and they were, you know, just catching fish after fish, but my buddy wasn't. So he, and I suggest to do this anywhere. If anybody is listening and you go to, say you go out West and you try to go fish, you know, the Madison or stop by a local fly shop. These people work on these streams. That's not a big box store. Go in, purchase a hat, purchase some flies and just ask questions. These people are a plethora of knowledge and this is how they make their living is opening up a fly shop. This is their passion. They know the bugs that are working on this stream. They know that the different color uh, variations, one may, you know, it may be a orange fly that you think is working, but it may be uh, like a peach orange that's actually what's working on that stream. Just some, some, some dubbing is just too bulky for what we're, we're trying to tie. Some threads are just too big and cord like to try to build up a hot collar on it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a trial and error. It really is. Anything else about this style of fishing that you think we should know that we haven't covered? Um, have fun with it. I mean, you know, obviously it's good enough for the, the, the Euro or for the Olympic team. Have fun with it. Um, if you don't, if you get frustrated, don't quit. Uh, the one thing I see a lot of people uh, when guiding is they get frustrated with casting or they get frustrated with, you know, they're, they may just not know the characteristics of a stream. So they may be fishing in places where there's not that many fish. Don't get frustrated and say, I'm not doing fly fishing. I'm just going to go back to a, a bobber hook and worm. <laughs> yeah, that's why we, that's why it's, it's amazing to me how many people, you know, you, you, <laughs> you mean you don't use live stuff? No, no, no. We, we, I, you know, follow my dog around with a, with a brush and, and use his fur for dubbing. Uh, and that's kind of, it's, it's a joke, but in the beginning, that's pretty much what people did. You know, they, they, they would get a dog and they'd pull the hair off the dog or they'd get the chicken or the, the turkey feather on the ground. But don't get frustrated. You know, if you truly have an interest in this style of fishing, find a mentor and uh, just ask questions. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a number of people that are out there that I know for a fact that if you send them a question, they will be more than happy to answer George Daniels, Jason Randall, you know, people who have truly mastered this, I still am learning about this every single day. I, I like to think that when I wake up, if I learned one thing that day about fly fishing, then I feel successful. Doesn't mean I have to actually be on a stream to catch a fish, but if I sit down and I can learn one thing, then that means that it's something that I can apply to my fishing and my application on a stream. And then once I have learned how to master that, pass it on to someone else because that's that's the only way that fly fishing will continue is, is is we get good people who love to just you know stand in a stream waving a stick Man, it was I mean, awesome John, you put Braden on his first trout with that <laughs> Braden's a good kid yeah if, if, if anybody if anybody ever wants to see what 
the future of fly fishing looks like. Braden Miller from Virginia, he's he is a phenomenal fly tire. Um, he does a lot of big bait fish uh, streamers. Um, we're we're trying to break him into the little stuff, but uh, well, his but, eyes you know, are good. Yeah, well, his eyes is good. Um, thank God for contacts, right? Yeah. Because um, if it wasn't for contacts, I don't even know how I would be tying. But Braden's a good kid. Um, you know, he's he's what the future holds, and I know that I've personally seen him take a kid into his booth uh, just actually at the Virginia show uh, and teach him how to tie a fly. So, you know, he understands what it's going to take to continue this great sport of ours. I mean, he loves it for what it is. It's not always about catching a fish. It's about understanding why we, you know, sat down and tie a fly thinking about a fish. Um, you know, it's about, it's about all that. All right. So we, we talked about earlier, how does fly fishing help you with such a high stress level job? You know, for me, it's, I, I used to get really, really aggravated. And when I was in my, you know, my teens, when I would go and I wouldn't catch a fish. Now, mind you, I was a conventional fisherman then. Uh, I piddled around with fly rods, but what, what in my older age, you know, I'm in my thirties now I've learned, uh, to have patience. I still get excited. You know, I still am one of the first ones when my buddies parked to, you know, take off to the stream. But what I find is that with the flow of a stream comes uh, an understanding of life. And when you do work in a stressful job, um, it's amazing to me when I'm guiding and I see people come from, you know, different aspects of life, lawyers and doctors. And, and you watch them pick a fly rod up. And the first thing that you notice is their thumb is completely white because they're pressing their thumb on the fly rod so hard. And you say, hey, have you had a stressful week? And they say, oh, absolutely. And I say, look, you know, fly fishing isn't supposed to be stressful. And I ask them, do you have, you, do you have kids? And they say, yeah. I said, do you remember when your first kid was born? And they say, yeah. And I said, do you remember how you held their hand? And they say, really soft. I said, you hold the fly rod the same way. I said, and if they say they don't have any kids, I try to find something, whether they're married and how they held their wife or their husband's hand. And fly fishing should always be peaceful. Um, it should always bring you some type of peace and relaxation. You know, I feel when I leave a stream that whatever I've dealt with, whether it be, you know, a drug overdose or a, or a fire or a car wreck where, you know, you see someone in their roughest point in their life. I always feel when I'm going to a stream and I'm driving, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, well, what's the water temp going to be? What's the color of the water going to be? What's the flow of the water going to be? But in the back of my mind, I feel like I'm, I kind of take all the stress from that week's shift or whatever, and I pack it up into a suitcase. And whatever stream I'm in, I, I let it flow. I let it kind of soak into the water and, and go away. And that's kind of my way of saying this is why I do what I do. It's not always about catching a fish. It's just about being in a place where the energy of the water allows me to kind of center myself and then be a better fireman, be a better flat tire, be a better you know, boyfriend or, or, or father or son or brother or whatever it is. And, and when, when you start to really get into this, I think a lot of people, that's what they don't understand. Well, why are you so wrapped around fly fishing? And they don't understand that in the subsurface of all this, there's a culture, you know, how I met you, Rob, you know, how I met Jason Randall, how I've made the friends and the connections that I, we all have. And, I think that when we go to, you know, a stream, you know, you can always stop and talk to somebody. And, you know, I, I'm one of these people, I tie a lot and I, I love to tie because it's my way of visiting a stream. But I always carry more flies than I probably should because if I walk up on a stream and I see somebody fishing and they, they start a conversation with me and they say, well, hey, if you fish this run, you may pick up a few fish. Well, how can I say thank you? And I always pull a fly out of my box and say, here, you know, thanks for the conversation. So there's a subsurface. There's a, a, a culture that we have in, in this world, and it's it's filled with good, good people, and I hope that it continues. Absolutely. Are you ready to do some silly questions now? Sure, why not? All right, if you had one deli meat to eat for the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> uh, the buffalo chicken. I, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I go, I like going to Kroger's and definitely 
slide, getting a big thing of that and longhorn cheese and lettuce and, you know, dill pickles and making a sandwich. Best sandwich you've ever had? Oh, absolutely, because I made it. There you go. What <laughs> uh, what superpower would you pick if it could make you a better angler? <laughs> the view of a fish and the understanding. <laughs> it's, it's like, I think I think as a man in this world, <laughs> I think understanding fish is as hard as understanding women. Yep. <laughs> absolutely. Hot dogs, you put ketchup or mustard on them? Um... Both with chili and coleslaw and cheese. That's a West Virginia thing right there. I've always seen that hot dog place in the bus in West Virginia yeah. on the food shows. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, what, uh... oh, that's, uh, that's Hillbilly Hot Dogs, man. That's out on Route 2 outside of Huntington, West Virginia. It's, it's legitimately, they took a bus and you can sign the bus. And it's, yeah, it's just about as, as, characteristics of west virginia as you can get if anybody on the outside that's listening to this listen we're, we may be a bunch of backwoods you know born and raised in the holler but i tell you we're a bunch of smart people we uh look we know how to eat we know how to make moonshine and we know how to hunt and fish <laughs> when is it okay to pose with a fly rod on your shoulder Ooh, um i'll tell you what like that's the hardest pose to make because you know you got to fish, and then you got to try to get your. For me, if you're proud of what you're doing, then absolutely take a picture. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And if you if it's truly truly that you love to fly fish, then absolutely take a picture of your fly rod. Um, you know, you've you've worked hard for it uh, to pay for that fly rod, so take a picture of it. I don't care. <laughs> people always I see people always saying. You know, well, it's the it's the picture. Look, that guy's fishing. As long as he's doing ethically, ethically, let him take whatever picture he wants. There you go. What advice would you tell someone just getting started in fishing? I guess that'd be don't get frustrated. Don't get frustrated. Uh, it's it's it is legitimately, and and I I know this is going to sound completely off the wall, but take your favorite car. For me, it's a it's a 1970 Chevelle Super Sport, and go to a barn find one that is completely rusted out the motor don't work the flat tires are flat take it to a garage and rebuild it and the minute you sit down in that nice leather seat or whatever and you put the key in and you turn it and you hear that engine roar that for me is pretty much what fly fishing has been it has been a building block after building block after learning curve after learning curve of learning and reading and uh, YouTubing and and standing in a stream, you know, casting a thousand casts without a, a, fly, a fish. It has been the most stressful, most enjoyable, most exciting thing that I, I have experienced. And do not get frustrated. Do not, you know, when it comes to that car, you know, if you can't get a bolt out, don't give up. You know, if you can't set a drift up or you hate mending or, you know, whatever it is. And, and we're talking about, you know, trout fishing, obviously. But, hey, look, if you do, if you love saltwater fishing, I know guys that are catching Mako sharks on fly rods right now. And, you know, I got the fortune uh, um, to watch the, the fly fishing film festival where those guys. And you can't imagine the excitement you hear in this guy's voice as he's screaming as this Mako shark comes flipping out of the water. Whatever fly fishing you are doing, don't get frustrated because I'm telling you, the minute you feel the tug, the minute you become successful, you will then know that it is all worth it and you are officially born and baptized into a culture of crazy fly nutcases like us. What's the strangest thing you've seen on the water? <laughs> um, the strangest thing. Wow, that's that's a good one, Rob. That's a that's a good question. The strangest thing. Two people falling in love, I think. <laughs> I think that uh, the strangest thing I, I've seen is is two people go on a date and they find something that is it brings them together. Uh, you know, I've seen 
black bear walk the stream. You know, I've seen deer walk across the stream while I'm fishing. But to see the connection between people on a stream is both strange because of the culture that we're in. I know that I know that's completely off topic, but but it, I think that it's one of the coolest, neatest things that fly fishing can bring. What's your most unusual fly tying material? <laughs> um, the, <laughs> so when I first started, I didn't, I, um, I wanted some tailing material, some tail material. I, I had some pheasant tail and stuff. <laughs> Not that I tie with it now because, you know, I, I tie a lot with the cock daily on. So when I was 16 years old, we, uh, I was in, I was, I was, I played football and we all shaved our head. And I had really long hair at the time, like it come down and hit the bridge of my nose. And so I bagged some of it up and I actually tied some flies when I was 16 years old with my own hair. That apparently makes really good musky flies is yeah. human hair. I don't know. I musky is, is my next big, big fish that I'm going to go after. I, I'm a trot guy. I think, you know, I just, I love the mountain streams, but yeah, I think I'm going to, I'm going to go after some, some, E socks. <laughs> and I think my last question is going to be if you left one item of gear at home that would screw your entire day over, what would it be? <laughs> oh, man. Well, hmm. I'd have to say it would be one of my temple fork alphabet rods. Because I just, you know, I mean, you know, you can whittle a stick like they did in the old days, but, you know, if you, if you don't have your rod or if you don't have your reel, then. Yeah, I mean, I can we can sit here and try to flip, you know, leaders out with flies, but I'd say have to be one of my TFO rods. There you go. All right, Joe, where can we find you on social media if people have questions, comments, want to see your flies, etc.? Um, I I have Instagram. It's Appalachian Fly Guy, and then of course on Facebook, it's um, let's see, I think it's I think it's. It is Joe Bragg picture. It, the picture is of uh, me and my girlfriend, and then the backdrop is me and my daughter. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, enjoy yeah. your uh, snowy Thursday. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to – we've been watching the st- or the ice form in the Erie Tribs, so no steelhead, no brown fishing for a while. Um, so I don't know. I may go chase natives. Um or some trout down on the Elk River sometime soon. I'm looking forward to fishing Montana this year and Oklahoma and some some in Texas. So it's going to be an exciting year. Um, Good for you. Yeah. yeah, you too, man. We're going to go shad fishing, aren't we? That's the plan. Uh, you got to. I mean, I get you got to. That's that's a whole new discipline that I've got to learn, man. Because uh, you toss some wacky bugs. I ain't gonna lie. Like you toss some wacky stuff. I got to learn. Yeah, man, it's fun. I like being creative. I started coming Absolutely. up with a new idea the other day. Yeah, what is that? Uh, it's like articulated. It's like the frog foam I use, but yeah. cut up into... I, there's a fly that's kind of like it. It's already out there, but it's basically just like a centipede on the water. There you go. Yeah, I want like articulated topwater yeah. flies. Uh, that's something like... Uh, let's see. I like how people are tying like baby ducks for big brown trout now. Yeah. And it's ar- articulated, but... Yeah, that's the one thing I if if it was anything that I when it comes to fly fishing, obviously the advice that I tell people, but when it when it comes to fly tying, there's a few things. And I if you don't mind, I, I can add this in. Go for it. More is less, less is more. Don't use a lot of material to tie your fly. Use what you ha- you can. Uh, it is good to go take a some type of water entomology class so you kind of understand. You know, go to a fly tying convention, you can take um, you can take some pretty good classes. Um, there was a, a guy from Ascent Fly Fishing that does a really, really good one. Um, and and just sit down and understand that fly fly tying is the extension of fly fishing. If you want to tie flies, there is a creativity of it. You do not have to tie imitation that is dead center. This looks like a bug. Just take and sit down and and. Be creative. It is an art. It is a passion. It is expensive unless your significant other asks. Then you say, no, it's cheaper to, to tie flies than it is to buy them. But, Absolutely. Um, 
yeah so all right man well um i'm gonna get on the road to uh, edison yeah i know you're you're gonna be uh up in the on the big show yeah i uh while you go there i'm gonna get on a plane tomorrow and i'm flying to texas very cool man we'll have fun yeah Safe thanks travels. for bringing me on man all right you dude too. i'll see you when the shot arrive all right all right cheers thanks Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.